Okay, uh, USBE strategic plan. Superintendent, are you ready to, now, uh, we have a couple things. So how long is this? You're gonna call in and we're gonna try to be done by, superintendent, you've got a report and I have a brief. So I'm just looking at the time. We have about a, we have about probably a, a half hour. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you board members. We are really excited about this um, opportunity to talk about the strategic plan. As you know, it's been a bit of a long haul and, and you've passed off the uh, vision and mission and uh, we have great forward momentum. At our last, um, was it last month, December, November, where <laughs> at some point you adopted goals that have really driven this work. And um, so as we mentioned to you last time, we uh, would get you the strategies ahead of time, which we have done. They've been posted in your materials. And um, rather than going into them at great detail, we're going to present to you um, each goal and uh, have you look at the strategies and then discuss any that you may want to add or you have questions about or concerns about rather than going through each one at a time. Also just a rem reminder about the process that we've had work groups working in each of these goal areas and, and they've been comprehensive work groups. This is um, your plan. So it, it's not like um, some of the things that we've taken out very broadly to the field, um, but in this case, we've had feedback all along. So the work groups have been primarily internal, but it's based on work that they've been doing out in the field. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so we will start with then just a quick view of the vision and mission. This is especially for, oh, sorry. Okay, um, so this is especially for our four new board members, but to, um, to those of you who haven't memorized this and in your sleep, um, just a, a recollection of our conversation around um, the vision is what we aspire to. And so the verbiage that you've passed off on our vision is here. And then the mission is how we go about that. So um, one of the key phrases within the mission is that you as a board create the conditions and, uh, and that you advocate and develop policy. So we're not in the classroom. You can't be in the classroom. To, well, some of you are in the classroom every day. Um, but generally as a board, we're not at the LEA level making these decisions. So thinking about how the strategies and goals align um, to the way we do our business. So the four goals. Um, we have headings that are early learning, personalized teaching and learning, effective educators and leaders, and safe and healthy schools. But notice that the verbiage underneath is active. So it's not just about a category. Uh, for example, in early learning, each student um, starts strong through early grades with a foundation of literacy and numeracy. So trying to define what each of those headings mean. So now we'll jump right into the strategies that are aligned with the goals. Um, and um, we gave you some samples uh, prior, and in front of you, you have the, um, the handout. So if you look to the left side, you'll see the goal in salmon, pink, <laughs> and um, in what looks to be on my sheet, sort of green, the uh, light green, the strategy. So we discussed these a little bit last time, but we also try to play these out about what you might see. So again, thinking about the overall strategic plan, you have strategies, you have then an a action steps and um, who's responsible and timelines, and that's how a strategic plan gets carried out instead of a few words on a paper in a binder on a shelf. We're trying to avoid that and really uh, hold ourselves accountable to this strategic plan. So um, we'll give you a minute to look at early learning and um, look at the strategies. And then um, Chair Huntsman will just rely on you to call on anybody that might have their light on. Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. Maybe for 
the purpose of discussion, I'd like to make a motion for something specific, might give people something to grab onto. So I move that we approve the proposed strategies for the early learning goal. Do we have a second? Okay. Lots of seconds. Discussion to the motion, and the motion is that we approve the proposed strategies for the early learning goal. Board Member Hansen. I noticed that our access committee would like us to add something about equity. Do you guys have an idea of where that would best, do you have some suggestions? We're going to address that with some suggestions after we get through okay. these goals. Thank you. I'm, I apologize, we should have said that up front. Okay, I'm not seeing any other discussion. I'll restate them. I'll restate the motion and then we'll vote. I move that we, the, the, the motion is that we approve the proposed strategies for the early learning goal. Um, I guess I'm not gonna vote. Board Member Earl. I, I just have a question. I just feel like, and I've seen this at the legislature over the last several years, we keep moving further and further from that kindergarten age which, you know, at one point, and I understand we want to help children as soon as we can, and we do that in a variety of areas. I'm just wondering where, where is that cut off to where we're, we're in the home taking over a parent's role versus um, what, what we really are responsible for versus what they really are responsible. I'm just, I, it seems like that line continues to gray and we continue to move not only in data collection, um, and I know last year they were, they were talking about prenatal data collection so that we could do the best for that. I just wonder I, where government's role ends and public education's role ends. Do you know what I mean? How far down do we go? I, I guess that's my question. I'm not saying any of these are necessarily poor, but I just, I, I guess philosophically I'm, I'm concerned where, you know, where's the next thing? Where's the next thing? And this, where, especially where this is a primary goal, we've got four major focuses and where are we going? I guess is my question. Does that is that a fair? Mm -hmm. So, do you want an do you want an answer to that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So I think that's a I think it's a fair question, and it comes up often. It comes up on the Hill with legislation. Um, this has been a board discussion before. That, uh, as you likely know, Board Member Earl, the um, board's jurisdiction falls K twelve. In some states, it's P twenty. But this board in this state, it's K-12. However, um, talking about kindergarten is definitely linked to um, uh, preschool. And although that's not something that falls within the board's jurisdiction always, we are brought into that via legislation. So partnerships with, um, with others out in the community to try and help determine what does high quality preschool look like in some cases um, distribution of, of funds that might flow through from a grant uh, this is a state that doesn't require uh, uh, kindergarten um, so that's that's optional for families so I think Utah is still in a space at this point where um, there's a lot of family choice about that and um, while the medical community the education community others uh, based on neuroscience, really know the importance of early learning. Uh, I, I would concur with you that our role is to support families in early learning. So if you look at, for example, the UEN website, they've got some great resources for families. Um, and uh, there are a lot of places where, where we really talk about what are ways that we can support families and parents. In some of the hospitals, they're giving out books to newborn mothers. So, um, you know, I think this is a state that continues to value that. How, how do you support families in those early learning um, stages instead of trying to dictate what that looks like? Yeah, it's, it's fair. We're yeah. stepping those boundaries, yeah. so. Um, board, members, board member Scott Hanson. Oh, and Chair, I also have a question. I've been involved over the past few years with um, Ogden Weber Community Action Partnership. Uh, they sponsor Head Start mm -hmm. um, in Ogden. And this is in many ways in direct competition with what they're doing, unless we're servicing a different segment of the population. That's mostly for lower income families. But in some cases, I know that they've been using 
school district facilities for Head Start and now we're being forced out into the community and looking for um, uh, facilities where they can operate their Head Start because now the school district's taking on some of those. Could you speak to that for a moment? I don't, are we servicing that same segment of population and, and is that what we intend to do here to compete with Head Start? Yeah, so I, th I think, uh, again, that's it's not our role as the board to um, create policy that dictates what happens in LEAs and communities. Mm -hmm. But if you look at recent legislation around early learning, it's it's more of a collaborative and a cooperative. So private preschools are part of legislation and receiving funds, and as long as they, um, you know, are of high quality, et cetera. So um, I think that I think I'm seeing the opposite of what I'm hearing you say. But when you're forced out of a building because they need the space, I think that's a different issue. Um, Head Start does not fall under the jurisdiction of districts, as you know. It's a, it's a federal, federally funded program. So I think there are a lot of players in the space for early learning, and that's a good thing for our kids. I, you know, I think um, the more opportunities we have, especially in the very communities that you're talking about, there, e even Head Start, there's li there are limited seats. Um, in Head Start. So the fact that the district is investing in preschool as an option for families, I think is a great thing. Because they, again, they have more options now. At least in the short term, we are setting up some kind of competition between, um, I think we're competing for the same kids short term. Longer term, I think it was, will sort itself yeah, out. Yeah, uh, yeah, hope yeah. so. Um, AAG. AAG Buse. I just wanted to um, say that that's just like you said, it's an LEA decision. There are some LEAs that actually are cooperatively run the, the Head Start programs in mm -hmm. their districts. So it just really is a, an LEA decision on how that Head Start program fits in with the whole big cooperative picture. Some, some cooperate in that they actually operate the Head Start programs through their district. Hey, Board Member Lisa Cummins. Um, Board Member Earl, just to draw your attention, the ESSA asks um, the state, especially if we're taking uh, federal monies and grants to to implement pre-K. Um, well, I am very much opposed to this. I think it's a growth of government, um, and I think um, uh, an intrusion onto family values and 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 drawing parents away from their primary role as parents, um, we're pretty much mandated to provide these services um, and um, programs and strategies uh, as part of the state plan uh, as mandated under the Department of Education. Unless you want to clarify. Sure, husband. Yeah, I, I would like you to clarify because that's not part of ESSA. We are not mandated to have preschool programs as part of ESSA. Yeah, so if you can get us that reference, that would be great, because that's not in our plan and it's not part of ESSA. I have a nice concrete question for you. <laughs> so on 1B and 1C, you talk about address funding needs by advocating for legislative appropriations and promoting braided funding and sliding fee scale models. What in the world does that mean? I mean, I know what advocating for legislative appropriations means, but promoting braided funding and sliding fee scale models, how does that help us reach the goal? Yeah, can talk about that? Sure. Um, so sliding fee scale models are um, opportune options where based on um, ability to pay, um, a parent or family may provide some of the payment and then um, the state may provide uh, some of the payment and I think that's going on in like canyons, canyons and other districts is how they that. have expanded optional um, kindergarten <coughs> uh, is that, So that means that parents are actually being willing to pay for extended kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Okay mm -hmm. um, And then braided funding models are essentially when there's multiple funding streams that are out there from the state from the federal government locally um, that you um, essentially combine those funding streams um, for the, if they're intended for the same outcome. Um, and it's just a, an essentially a more efficient and aligned way. Um, so you can kind of optimize resources okay. that way. Thank you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I've always kind of 
read the research on oral language base and things like that and thought we, we it's great to have good opportunities pre-K and prior to first grade. And um, then I was looking over Scott's um, budget and saw it had like $9 million <laughs> with, it, with the preschool. And I thought, do I like it that much? I don't know. I mean, I think there's room for discussion there, but th but it's legislated and the money is appropriated. So now we have to look at what we have here and based on what we have here, I really like the words um, optional access because that honors all parents' rights. They can pick if they want and don't pick if they don't want. I like the words um, high quality because it means we're, we're monitoring, we're not just kind of throwing money at random programs. I like 1D, increasing engagement of families with young children in early learning experiences by, by partnering, community partnerships and things like that. I, I wasn't part of making this. I'll support the group who did make it, the board prior to me coming on board. Um, but thanks for your work on all this. Thanks. <coughs> board Member Lear. Um, I have a just a very simple request, and you've done so much work on this, and the language is so carefully chosen, but I would just beg you one of the things that I think is really helpful for people reading this is if we, we stay away from jargon like braided funding, because Tiffany, your explanation was so much more clear to me if we could just, because I think that's kind of off-putting for non-educators, and so I'm not trying to be critical. I really don't mean it that way. It's so carefully written, but I just... And there are several of a couple of other places. So if we could just yeah, and just just a reminder, um, and this is for all of you. I, I probably wasn't clear enough on this. Um, on the right, those are not strategies. It's as part of the strategy. Here are action steps oh. you might see. So, so the we strategies are green. Yeah, we the strategies are in the green okay. that you're voting on. So on the right hand side, we wanted to provide information of what what oh. does this look like in practice, or what might it look Perfect. like in practice. So I apologize that I wasn't clear. So about that's that. that makes me feel a lot better. Thank you. Um, the motion on the table here is that the board the board approve the proposed strategies for the early learning goal which are in the green I'm not seeing any other discussion so let's vote on that motion and the motion is that the, the board approve the proposed strategies for the early learning goal all in favor say aye, aye. those opposed voting was unanimous okay so moving on to the effective educators and leaders goal um, so the strategies are here on the slide as well as in front of you. Um, I'll read through them really quickly. So uh, support districts and schools in providing effective mentoring and coaching for beginning educators and leaders. Um, assist districts and schools in providing continuous personalized professional learning for each educator and leader. Um, evaluate and support educator preparation programs in meeting requirements established by the board while providing room to innovate. Uh, increase the supply of transformational school leaders across the state. Uh, promote equitable access to effective teachers and lead in changing the perception of teaching as a profession. So, questions, motions? Okay. <clears throat> um, board member Jenny Earl. I, there's two of them that I love. I love 2A and I love 2F. These, um, and we know from research that in supporting those beginning teachers, those teachers that are first coming in, that a great mentor is going to assist them in making it a successful year and a successful career possibly. Um, and then also, I just think, um, oh, what, is there one more on there? Hold on, there was one on, Oh, it's, it's 2D, leading and changing the perception of teaching as a profession. I just think this is such a powerful thing, especially where we've recently um, allocated funding for um, public, um, what, to send messages out in the public, right? I just think this is a key element. So often we send the negative out, or we see the negative out in the public. We don't always, there's great things going on, but we need to create an environment where we're carrying on dialogue that we treat each other as professionals and we treat our teachers as professionals. And we're seeing that um, on a public level. Um, I do have concerns with 2E. Two, two e. I'm not sure, that sounds great amongst us to make sure that everybody's equal in, the, in the, all the schools. But the reality is, is I don't think this, I don't know how you do this. 
And the reason why I say that is because sometimes I've seen schools where you have a poor administrator and everybody exits the school and there is no control over, do you know what I'm saying? And I've seen schools that have a great administrator and everybody clings to there. And I'm, I'm using administration, but it can go in a lot of different ways. So I'm, I'm really curious how we do this as a, as a this, is, this is an LEA thing, I think, and a local board thing, at least in my perception. I don't know how, as a board, we, we create goals that make things equitable in all schools. As far as teachers go, that just I can't understand that. But maybe I'm. Yeah, I, I think it's a good question, and this this is one. I'll just tell you, this is one that I personally feel passionate passionate about, and I'll tell you why. Um, I've worked in four different districts, and they were uh, one was a little smaller, but the other three were fairly large. And um, I think there are a couple of things. Um, of course, this you know I worked in these places before we have the some of the um, diversity both in economics and um, students coming who are learning English and some of the other uh, challenges that we have that take additional resources. But oftentimes you would see a policy that was created that was <laughs> focused on equal instead of equitable. And so those are two different terms. And, and so when we talk about equitable, it's our students um, getting the resources they need when they, when they need it. So you might have a policy that says, um, for example, um, new teachers are going to be placed in slots after we've had involuntary transfers and anybody that wants to transfer. And so we're sticking brand new teachers in, um, in classrooms that sometimes are hard to fill, hard to manage, maybe large class sizes, maybe with a new principal. So, um, is it our place to do that in a, in a local setting? No. But we can provide data to say, let us show you how many new teachers you have and how they're spread out across the district. Our CACTUS database, um, it makes it very easy for us to run those kind of reports. And it's more, so it's providing awareness of where, how they've got new and inexperienced and out of field teachers distributed. So that's one way that we can support that. Uh, another way is to um, share research on how important it is to have a good distribution of um, teachers who can support one another with experience and uh, content knowledge and effectiveness and those kinds of things. So for me, it, th this is one of those that has an imperative mentally for me, um, thinking about it can be really damaging to students if they are, to your point, Board Member Earl, in a, in a school where they uh, might have an ineffective or an inexperienced uh, principal and, um, you know, a school full of inexperienced and new teachers. So helping the LEAs be more strategic in their thinking about how they choose their policies and uh, oftentimes it's just awareness. So helping them with that awareness and um, the research and support. It's, it would not be our place to go in and tell them where to place teachers. But there are a lot of, um, sometimes as I've spoken with, district officials, they'll say, well, gosh, we didn't, what, what are some things you could do? Like, what are some practices that you're aware of? And we have um, some data clearing houses and other places like Education Commission of States and places where we can go and say, here's some good policy, here's some, um, here are some best practices that you might consider. So just like we do with anything, we, our role would be more of a technical assistance role, not one to dictate policy to the LEAs. Um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. I'd like to move that we approve uh, the proposed strategies for the effective educator and leader goal. Second. Leader's goal. <clears throat> the motion is that the board approve the proposed strategies for the effective educators and leaders goals. Is there a second? Second. Second board member Lear. Discussion to the motion, uh, board member Cannon. Yes, I'd just like to discuss with you for a minute uh, 2C, which is evaluate and support educator preparation programs. Um, how, what, uh, what percentage of our teachers that are, are coming out are now prepared by educator preparation programs? I don't know that exact percentage. It's still the bulk of them. Is it in the 90s? Is Travis still here? No. I think the last time we looked, it was still well into the 90s, but I'm not, I, don't quote me on that. Even okay. though I just made a public statement, <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I won't quote you. It's still, it's still fairly high. Again, we have ten preparation programs 
and they're they're fairly robust. Unlike other states who have a little a lot of one offs, we have a pretty um, solid, well standing uh, preparation program connection throughout the state. So that's still the bulk, I believe. So I I get I'm just thinking ahead a little bit about all of these people that are are uh, going to be coming in with the LEA specific licenses, and we won't have. A, we won't reach them with this, and I guess my concern is that um, we will need to come up with something to try to reach them. So that's where you could have, um, you know, you could discuss action steps that you could take within that goal. And this is, um, it's, it's about educator preparation, but it could be an LEA program, it could be a university program, that's why we didn't um, specify what, what that program looks like or where it's located, because it's really about all educator preparation, and um, I, I gave comments last night in, um, okay, now I've got the compute, law and licensing. Um, so board members that were in that committee heard sort of my two cents about the role that you play in educator preparation, regardless of how that looks. But this is where the rules that you're debating around licensure and preparation program would fit right in here. So that's, that's actually a strategy where you have a lot of room for input and policy levers, for sure. Thank you. Okay, the um, board member Jenny Earl. Can I propose an amendment? Would that be a you may propose a, to a change? Um, I would actually propose removing equitable and just putting promote access to highly effective teachers. And here's my thinking in that. Um, Equitable would suggest that we have only so many, and so we're going to try to evenly divide them amongst our our LEAs. Where, when if we put on there, and it, we still do the same thing, we're promoting access to highly effective teachers um, for and for all children, and not just. I'm, I guess the equitable element suggests that there's so many, and we're going to make sure that they're evenly placed amongst our. Um, our districts or our LEAs, or provide them the information so they can more, they can move them around. I think going our overall goal should be to access highly. Um, I guess I'm. I need a second. What am I doing? <laughs> Why don't you stop me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm here explaining, and then is that what it is? <laughs> I'm listening. We're, we're listening. You are listening really well. Sorry, I could catch myself here. I'll second it and then so, well, I just and I think you get the idea. The idea that there's. Let me restate that. We're removing the, it out. The, the so motion. The motion okay. is to <laughs> on two e to eliminate the word Jeremy, equitable. <laughs> Board member Bolter, did you do you agree yeah, with us? Second, <laughs> second and dis discussion to that. And I I I'm not cha jumping into a lot of things and mm -hmm. equity and um, discussions of equity with for our board. Are big decisions and and big discussion items of what, how equity, how does it work, how does it really happen? The reality is, can you really get there? But the goal, but I've surrendered to the fact that I'm okay, okay to have it if it's something that we're we're not saying we're going that we that we don't forget about it. And occasionally in our documents, we the the word equity works for me because I, I think that it drives us to try to make it happen, but it's not an absolute. And then when you get to the, some of the strategies to try to do it, it's sharing best practices to try to bring it forth. And I, okay. so I, I'm, guess not, I'm not a big. I guess I would prefer that we had all highly effective teachers. And I know that's maybe the sunshine, you know, whatever out there. Yeah. But that very idea that promoting access, that, that's what we want in all of our classrooms. Um, and the mm -hmm. very way to do that is what they're saying, is saying, look, this is, this is how we need to make sure we're, you know, we're, we're aware of what's going on, we're aware of the differences, that kind of a thing. So anyways, that's. I, I usually don't jump up on equity because I, I, I know how it can be very difficult at times, but this is about one of the few times that I would say, oh, it's okay for, it goes through my. I guess I'm wondering, also, when you when you create a goal, you also have to have a way of achieving it. And so I'm wondering, what's mm -hmm. the teeth if, if and, and maybe there isn't, but what, what's the teeth that says that, what if there is, we have entities that are not, I guess, equitable and in whatever way we're measuring, so. And I don't also know. I see it just not equ equitable on 
teachers, or, or no, on on students, but it's it's on highly affected. So it, it it goes across the whole state. So that's just how I see it. But I will be quiet. Okay, Moshair, uh, Michelle, board member uh, Michelle Bolter. Um, I. I um I like that change because it's like a strategy, and the strategy, I mean, our overarching goal would be to promote access to highly effective teachers. Like that's what we want to do is to promote access to highly have every district have and every school have highly effective teachers, and then the goals in there, sharing best practices and things like that. Um, so it, this to me is like if. If a district has highly effective teachers, rather than taking those teachers and giving them to another district, saying, how are you doing that? What are you doing? How can we train our teachers so now we can build up highly effective teachers in our own district? Because um, I would think that would be the overall goal, not to just redistribute teachers, but to have access to highly effective teachers. So that was, I like the, the strategy part, but that's just like, this is the overall goal. And maybe it's a far reaching goal. I don't know, but so. Yeah. Um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. So I'm going to speak against this amendment. Um, not because I don't agree that every student should have access, but but when we think of um, this particular topic, it's not always about bad teachers versus good teachers. Sometimes it's experienced teachers versus inexperienced teachers. And so it, it's it's I think the word equitable is the main word in this particular strategy because it talks about being very thoughtful in that process of mentoring new teachers and where do we place them. Um, and do we give all the decision making power to um, long time educators to decide where they want to be or do, does, do we make uh, strategic decisions about where those educators will be placed and can have access to. And so to me, it's not just about good and bad teachers, but experience, inexperience, et cetera. And the equitable to me is the, the main word in this particular strategy. So I would speak against it. And Chair Huntsman, could we, um, could we show a visual to, um, to um, Vice Chair Cummins' comment? Yes. Would you be okay Does it take you a minute to bring it up? Maybe no, it's, I mean, it's right there. Okay, here we go. Um, I think that I really appreciated what um, Board Member Earls said because I think it's often this notion of um, redistribution is what equity is about, and that that actually would be equal and the opposite of equity. Um, and so I've seen that happen in districts that I've worked in, and I'll just take an example of something positive. When I worked in Granite, they they used that distribution that Board Member Earl described, where they said, "Okay, we have X amount of schools." and every school gets X amount of counselors, regardless of what's happening in the school and the need, everybody gets, I'm gonna make up the number of two. So everybody gets two counselors, regardless of what's going on in the school. And you had schools in a particular area that just were in high need and they needed, they needed more school counselors, where you had some other schools that their counselors weren't as busy. So you look at what are the needs and base the resources on the needs rather than that equal distribution. So, I mean, there are a lot, you, you can go on the web and see a, a lot of different visualizations, but if you look at this and just say everybody has the same resources, they're standing on the ground trying to grab an apple regardless of height, and then you, you give them ladders or whatever they need so that everybody can pick an apple, um, that's sort of a, a rudimentary definition of equity, but it's really looking at the barriers in the system and trying to remove barriers to kids getting the resources and the support they need. So um, that's, I just wanted to be clear that that's what we mean by equity, not, not a redistribution or an equal distribution. That's kind of the opposite of the way we're using the word, if that helps. Okay, the amendment to the motion I'll restate it is um, to remove the word equitable from 2E. Not seeing any, dis any further discussion, let's vote on the amendment. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. <laughs> Those, all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? No. Okay, we'll have the ayes raise your hand. 
we have, we have three. Um, board Member Lisa Cummins, Board Member Jenny Earl, Board Member Michelle Bolter. Motion fails. Back to or the amended motion fails. Um, the amendment to the motion fails. The, the motion on the table is to that the board approve the proposed strategies for the effective educators and leaders goal. I've seen any discussion, so let's vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The voting is unanimous. How's our, how is our time? Well, we're, we were just discussing that back and forth about how to manage your expectations and time. Um, I think the two things we have left on the agenda um, are um, my report and your report and comments. Is that correct, sir? So um, I, can, I can literally give my report in 10 seconds. You can time me. <laughs> so that, or, or not at all. Um, we, I think, let's, let's try this next one and see if we can maybe well, get at it in under two minutes. let's see if we can do the minutes. two, I mean, okay. unless there's something, so. Okay. Uh, it, it's just a little time sensitive in that we are taking a document to the legislature in which you will all be involved in discussing um, some of these items and have, you know, have visuals prepared around these, so it's, it's really time sensitive, if that's okay. Can I? So I'm going to help expedite this a little bit. Okay, great. So. Vice Chair Brittany Cummins, did you have? Yeah. I, I'm just going to put the motion on the table to move to approve the proposed strategies for safe and healthy schools, the safe and healthy schools goal. Second. We have a motion and a second, and the motion is that the board approve the proposed strategies for the safe and healthy schools goal. Discussion to the motion. <laughs> You're fine. Right, I spent a lot of time thinking about these. <laughs> so, okay. Board, just board these are quick Jenny statements, and I, I'm, um, I just want us to be careful. Just as we're putting together safety plans, that we we still keep that broad because every school is so unique. So I'm, I'm hoping that's the intent. I don't know. We're kind of. I feel like I'm almost. Unfortunately, we're maybe racing through these important things that we've got to hurry and take to the legislature. So there may be some vetting, and I'm sorry I wasn't part of the other discussion that went along with this, but I just want us to be careful that we're not overreaching once again into that local entity who, um, who has unique needs when it comes to safety. So, okay. Does somebody want to address um, that? Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. And I, I shared your same concern on that particular one, but what I, I like about the wording is it is uniform guidelines for school safety plans so that when we, we have a shared vocabulary across the state so that we're not doing statewide plan, we don't have a statewide plan or here's what it needs to look like, but let's be at least a, l a little bit consistent so when Granite School District says this word, we all know what they mean. And so, so that, that's what I like about this, that it's just talking about guidelines, not uh, making the plans uh, at the state level. So and Chair Huntsman, if I may add, framework of it. Yes, yeah, you, you already passed a framework. So this board passed the framework that that is general in nature, and then the well, again, the strategy is um, to develop and adopt uniform guidelines for school safety plans and protocols. So the framework okay, is really kind of already there. The board could add to that framework or. Um, or includes some specific protocols, but that was the work of that broad-based committee that developed the framework, which is really guidelines, and so the locals would use that to frame their plan. Okay. We, uh, we concur with what you said. Board, board member Cindy Davis. Yeah. I, I had the same um, thought that Jenny did, but because um, I think it, when you originally talked about it, it seems like someone used the word uh, resource. You would create it as a resource for the local districts. Mm -hmm. I loved that word resource, but I, I think guidelines probably does the same, can do the same thing as well. Okay. And board member Lear. Yeah, just one quick thing to that, if I may. Okay. The, um, the committee, which included Department of um, public safety, and you, you know all the players uh, at the table, most of you. Um, they specifically wanted uniform guidelines uh, for the very reason that Vice Chair Cummins talked about. Not so, prescriptive. Not prescriptive, but the uniformity of language, so that when Department of Health sees the term 
Department of Public Safety knows what we mean, schools know what we mean. So it's that that's sort of where that uniformity came from. And just because so you call Go ahead. Yeah. Just because I'm so often the loving critic, I this is exactly where I like to see guidelines used instead of directives. Mm -hmm. I think this is just that's an excellent way to say it. Thank you. Okay, the motion motion before the board is that the board approve the proposed strategies for the safe and healthy schools goals. I'm not seeing any other comments. So let's vote on it. I'll repeat it again. Um, the motion is that we that the board approve the proposed strategies for the safe and healthy schools goals. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Voting is unanimous. I think there's one more section. And thank you, um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins, for moving this along. Okay. I move that we approve the proposed strategies for the personalized teaching and learning goal. Second. We have a motion and a second, and that is that we propose that we approve the proposed strategies for the personalized teaching and learning goals. Uh, discussion to the motion, Board Member Jenny Earl. Once again, I'm sorry, but um, please, please I do don't have. Apologize. I, okay. This is our meeting, <laughs> I your apologize. meeting. So. I am so excited about this that we're okay. we we're need. We're glad to be, you are. I um, it's the data driven decisions, and I we make data driven decisions, but it's this inoperability that we're, and the federal government just passed laws. Yeah. Okay, say that one more. <laughs> Interoperable, but it's that element where we lose our privacy, and I I do have great concerns over that as we are exchanging more and more data we're collecting more and more data we're storing more and more data about individuals and so um, goodness I don't even know what you'd I, I would I want us to make data driven decisions but it's that exchange of information without consent of individuals that I have a great concern over um, and I, I believe it's leading that way. That's what I'm seeing at the legislature as we are gathering more data on our, our young children. We're go gathering more data and we're creating systems that, um, and it, there's security issues with that too. Anyways, okay. those are my. Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. So I, th I wonder if the strategy is being more specific where we're trying to leverage the data that we already have and make the system more efficient um, and so I wonder if there's some words that we could add that would basically be speaking to because if you look at the you know the the par, um, what you may see um, as we're, we're talking about data that we have in the system but how do we access it in a more efficient way how do we understand it how can we use that data and gather it so I don't know if if it would help to add a word that we're not talking you know that we're we're looking at federal data and we want to give our data, but we want to make our system more efficient. I don't know. I don't know, maybe this slash and we add respect for privacy too. I don't I, know. And I, I personally don't see it as, as a threat because we're constantly, we're, we're asking our LEAs to be accountable. And when I, when I look at data, I'm not, I'm not limiting data to personal student achievement only or limiting it um, to that we're constantly as we're trying to make informed decisions we're wanting to see trends we're wanting to see things that are based on results on what's happening you know there's graduation rates I'll just throw that one up and other little milestones mm -hmm. we are we are terrible we are not good in the in the data business um, we're we have inconsistencies that come from our from our, not on purpose, just how we're designed from our LEAs and that. And so I, I there's no question I'm moving forward from this board that those guardrails for um, student data and everything that's happening there are, will, will be there for some time, at least for another four years. Um, but I don't view that as a threat, but we're constantly finding ourselves behind on what we can't do or what we can't explain or we, what we can't justify because we we don't have data and so I just my thought on it board member Lear no, I think board okay. member Lear um, I just wondered if it would make <clears throat> board member Earl that's late in the day 
<laughs> I was going to say board member Jenny, but that's a little weird. Um, would it feel, make you feel better if it said consistent with the law, or it, does that feel better to you? I, I, um, because I, I share board Huntsman's board chair Huntsman's feeling about you call me Mark. Um, that too. <laughs> Um, about about the tension between accountability and data, but I but I also always believe we should be consistent with the law. So is that something that makes you feel more? Does that help at all? Wait, you know, wait, <laughs> because we, we just at a federal level we just changed, we just we just created more operability. Interoperability. Interoperability. I'm, sorry. I'm thinking we have some inspiration this, down at the end of the table. What yesterday? I don't know. Whenever they vote Maybe on it, we're Dr. Sid has. We yes, we would like to propose some language. Certainly, we can't make the motion, but let us float something by you to see if it addresses that. Okay. Because we, we we agree with you. Um, okay. Oh, thank you, Tiffany, because I don't have my glasses with me. Um, <laughs> empower students, parents, and teachers with access to timely, useful, safeguarded data. I love it. So. You want me to read it or someone else? <laughs> well, no. Let's. Can you read it? Mm -hmm. Can you read it again? And if there is, um, in fact, I can if we're okay, I'm not seeing any problem with that. Yeah, and she, we'll replace it in the listening. document. Well, um, but I'll okay. read it again. Empower students, parents, and teachers with access to timely, useful, and safeguarded data. Yeah. And that's in 4A. That would replace the language in 4A. Okay. Without objection, I, I don't need an amendment. We, we've got to move here. Are you good? You made the motion. Go ahead. Okay. Maybe because that, because um, part of this uh, strategy was us uh, making those decisions, so maybe together with, so that includes ourselves. So together with. Um, Oh, or that empower word? ourselves, students. I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but we're now just empowering others with data mm -hmm. and decision making instead of that being our strategy to be data informed in the things that you we do. You say the board, and so empower the board. yeah. So add the board. The board, so that it would read then empower the board, students, parents, and teachers. Board with a capital B. Without, without objections, are you guys okay with this substitute? <laughs> okay. I'm going to go back to the motion, and the motion is that we approve the proposed strategies for the personalized teaching and learning goal as amended. Okay. All in favor say aye. Those opposed? Voting is unanimous. Thank you, Board Member Earl. That, I like it. Okay. okay, point two, which we feel is very critical. You have a, a wonderful advisory committee um, by the name of Access that, that we worked hard to create a couple of years ago, and their input is so valuable. As they've looked at the strategic plan, um, they raised an issue of uh, that we discussed, actually, with, when we were first putting the plan together, and that was um, where, where does this notion of equity or equitable fit into the overall plan because you might remember we talked about do we put it on the side is it where does it fit and in the end we just kind of took it out um, and said we would embed it in some other places access um, has come to us with some proposals so there are three different ways um, that we could look at this and I, I just Danelle I think you're in the audience will you raise your hand so they see you um, so Danelle is our um, and I'm so tired I'm blanking your last name Hold on. <coughs> What? I'm blanking your last name. Muir. Muir. Oh, I'm so sorry. To you can beat me later. Um, so um, she's here if you want to have conversations with her um, after. But um, so these are the three options for inclusion. One is that we could just add the term into the mission or vision. Uh, two is to add guiding principles that include equity. You, you might remember um, we used to have what we called imperatives, and you all talked about guiding principles, and we kind of pulled those back, um, or to add a definition. So, or a combination of any of them. So, um, he, so this is what that might look like. Tiffany, you want to that? <coughs> oh, sure. So here's just an example of that first option um, where you could potentially consider adding the word to the mission statement. So there it's underlined. Um, so before equitable or before the word conditions. 
Um, and then in terms of adding guiding principles, um, what a guiding principle it would be, we envision would be something that would be reflected in the selection of all the strategies. So it would be something that that would kind of guide the, our, our work. Um, and you would <coughs> probably want to also consider adding other guiding principles if you were going to add equity as a guiding principle. Um, or you could uh, add just a definition. Here's a potential definition. Um, I guess I'll read it. Equity is the equitable distribution of resources based upon each individual student's needs. Equitable resources include funding, programs, policies, initiatives, and supports that target each student's unique background and school context to guarantee that all students have access to a high quality education. Just a potential. Um, so that's, that's it. Those are a few options. And like I said, they're not mutually exclusive. Just a few <coughs> things to consider. So I'll go back to this slide. Uh, Chair, I'd move that we add equity to the mission statement, just the one word um, to make it uh, simple <coughs> and I think overriding so it would you know, pertain to the whole document by having it there in the opening sta mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd move that we adopt that option. And I second that. I like that. Me too. <coughs> motion and a second. Discussion to the motion. <coughs> It's not that I don't like equitable, but we had that in there before and we went over it and over it and talked about how are we at this level going to provide equitable versus just conditions for student success from this level where it's more done at an LEA level. Mm -hmm. Should we? We can do this. I feel like the, saying the State Board of Education leads by creating to the extent, if we want to say to the extent possible, I think that's presumed. But I, I understand our, our efforts are limited, but I think having it in there is a really important statement. And I think that's the most succinct way, the less, least mm -hmm. Troubling, controversial way to put it in there. Just, sorry, you've got to give me my mic again. <laughs> yeah, I, just as a follow-up, I, I believe that to the same extent that we can lead by creating conditions, we can lead by creating equitable conditions. The LEA is going to be the one's boots on the ground actually creating the conditions, but we're leading to do that. And I, I don't think adding that word is troublesome for me. Yeah, I, I think we will leave it the way it is. That's the direction I would go. I think equitable, once again, we're, I, I feel like we're, instead of every student, it's it's becoming, I don't know, we're, we're picking and choosing a little bit here. I just, I think leaving the mission statement the way it is, that's what I would go for. I, I think we can add a, um, a definition. I like the definition, and I think that could be added to it, but I would leave it the way it is. Um, I really think equitable conditions fits well with what we have after the colon because how do you lead by creating equitable conditions? You advocate for necessary resources. That creates equitable conditions. You develop policy. You provide effective oversight and support. And so to me, it fits really nicely. And as Board Member Hansen said, it's very succinct. Okay, grammar lady. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I just said the word colon. <laughs> 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 and a second and third discussion. So the motion is that we have the um, to our uh, mission statement. I'll say name the best of the All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Okay. So the aye is raise your hand. Just kind of like word number there. Sure. Board Member Hansen, Board Member Kravitz, Board Member Linda, sorry, I forgot Nancy before, I've been getting that down. Board Member Cindy Davis, Board Member Belknap, Board Member Cannon, Board Member Cummins. Nope. Vice Chair. No, Vice Chair, they come to the idea. Your sister from another mother. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. That's amazing. So we'll have a graphic organizer that uh, that 
captures everything that you just voted on that you can use. I, I propose we we add the definition. Yeah, we could easily do that. Can we do that? So that the definition that you put in there, I think, needs to be put there, especially if we're putting this in. Yeah, great. So, do I make a motion? I make a motion that we add the definition that was cited. Second. Yeah, motion. Second to add the definition. Of equity or equitable? It was, equitable. yeah. Okay. We have a motion and a second is for discussion on the definition. Seeing none of all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. What is the 